resources and the attention that everybody's giving to this from ver coming at it from various angles, sort of adding to more confusion. Uh, you know, I, I, I know the, and, and just to be upfront about it, I know that we set up a new task force in the legislature to also look at this. And I don't want that to be, add to the confusion. So we wanna work collaboratively with the administration if we're gonna get something done in a timely fashion. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and maybe you can bring us the latest and greatest. Thank you. You bet. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I agree. Like what we want to be careful about is actually creating overload and confusion. Um, and I'm glad both Linda and Darcy are on the phone because they can talk more detail in terms of specific um, programs right now. However, what I will share with you is that the team at ACCD has built a um, a web page where folks can go. In fact, I just I have a brother-in-law who's a who's a small business owner. And um, while we, you gave me an extra 15 minutes, I got on the phone with him and I walked him through our website. And it's, it, it actually was really slick because um, you land on the ACCD web, web page and you'll see the COVID-19 um, image. And it says financial assistance and guidance for Vermont businesses. So when you land on that, the next page, it's really clear. It says resources for business, resources for individuals and resources for communities. So if we wanna start with businesses, um, when you click on that, there um, is another box that says financial assistance. Um, the reason I say there's another box that specifically says financial assistance is because there's also folks who are still looking for sector guidance with respect to whether they should be um, continuing their operations right now. Um, so when you go to the financial assistance, it talks about the CARES Act and it's a very interactive, um, opportunity for people who, you know, you know, we have something, for example, it says, do you need capital to cost the cover of, to cost, do you need capital to cover the cost of retaining employees? And there's the, the link to the payroll protection program. So, um, and it goes on to talk about like the economic injury, um, disaster loan. And like with my brother-in-law, I was kind of taking him through and sure enough, he said, I want to apply for this economic injury grant and I was able to say bam like here you hit this link and now you're at the application on the SBA site so um, basically what what I, I view our team trying to do right now with respect to this part of the information is to create one stop for people to land there and again we're going to keep um, it's going to evolve as we get more information and um, as both Darcy and, you know, Linda will talk about, I'm sure is like, there's still guidance that we're waiting on. So we, you know, this thing isn't, it's not like it's complete. Um, but I think it gives people enough to, to give them an idea of where they should go. It also tells them, you know, when, in what situation they should go to their own lender or I think go to the SBA as well or Vita. But, um, a lot of folks find that really comforting that, you know, if they already have a lender that they have a relationship with there, you know, they can go to them. Um, my brother-in-law happened to mention, um, he said something about, uh, they, he said, they sent me the payroll protection information. And I said, who's they? And he said, my CPA. And I was like, awesome. So that's good news Great. too, right? The, the CPAs are getting yes. this information out as well. Yep. Um, so that's kind of like the business piece. The other thing that you'll find on that page is resources for individuals. So when you click on that, um, it will, again, it'll say like, you know, do you need financial assistance? Do you need, do you have a housing issue? Do you, you know, want to go right to unemployment insurance? So same thing, it's an interactive kind of asking people some questions and helping them try to navigate where they go. And the other, the third um, leg of this stool, which is still really being built out because again, the, the guidance is a little bit lagging and, and not for any fault, but the CARES Act included $5 billion in funding for the um, HUD Community Development Block Grant Program. And our share, Vermont share, is $4.7 million that will assist communities across the state. So um, that's, again, we have a little bit about that on our page, but that will be built out as the guidance comes through so that, again, communities who have, have experienced specific um, 
uh, negative effects as a result of this, or you know, also other um, can support other needs that their community has. Like this would be a place that communities could go and and you know propose how they might spend some of that money. So that's well, kind of where we're at. We um, our team has been, as you can imagine, pro very resource uh, drained, trying to help people come into compliance with the executive order, and I. I do feel, I just want to say, like, I, I do feel positive that for the most part, people are getting it and they understand there are always a few that kind of want to fight the individual battle and that's okay. Like we're, we're walking through that with them, but our goal is to, um, we've, we've started building a team that is really specific to that part of the business support, because what we need is we need to free our team up so that we can focus on. Um, the business recovery side of it, like this part, you know, building this this um, website out was really helpful, um, but we need to continue to try to, uh, what's the word, identify the areas that maybe there's some holes, like there's federal funding, but are there going to be some areas that we might, you know, say, come to you all and say, we need help because we, you know, there's a, there's something that's missing and we have to fill in that hole, but our team has to be thinking about those things and working together. So we're just trying to free up some capacity to work on, on some ideas. And then the other piece is obviously communications, you know, having the tourism and marketing department within the agency, we have a lot of assets um, that are generally used for outward facing um, uh, campaigns, I guess. And, you know, we really need to turn some of those assets inward now and and kind of you know if you kind of think of like the vermont strong campaign like help um create things that will uh provide vermonters with hope and reassurance that you know there's some relief on the way that it's coming here's how you access it so you know now that we're starting to build it and we're thinking about other areas that are missing we're also really thinking about the communications aspect and and making sure that folks do know where to go to get the help so those are some things we're working on, and uh, I'm I'm glad to be invited to you know the the task force that you're putting together. I think that it'll be you know helpful if some of you all we're trying to put a task force together too. So if we have some legislators on that, it'll help us not um, duplicate the efforts. You know we can can spread out the work that's necessary. So a uh, couple of questions on both the front end and the back end. Okay. On the front end. It's. I mean, the work you're doing sounds exactly what we need. But as you, as you have identified, we need people to look there as the default or the primary place to go. What communication efforts are out there at this point, now that this web page is up and running, to get people to know to go there? Like, you know, is there any kind of public service announcements or is the governor going to make a statement? I mean, I think uh, that's what we're trying to do is narrow yeah. down to a definitive, a uh, proper place to go. And then the back end is what happens to people, as you say, there are some people who will have individual challenges or either individual circumstances or they're just, their personality is such, or their skill level is such that they can't deal with it on the page, is there something on the page that directs somebody to more, to a more individual uh, attention? Yeah. So as far as letting people know that this website is up, we did announce that yesterday at the press conference. So that was sort of our public unveiling of it. And, um, and overnight, you know, we've been trying to share that page on social media. I noticed Senator Ballant shared it. Thank you. Um, but we, our team right now is working on, uh, again, we all hands were on deck to even build this thing. Um, so the comms team is now talking about public service announcements, um, you know, even paid advertising and social media. So they're, they're developing the plan. And it, I wish, you know, Heather was on the line because I think, you know, she probably could really share with you that she's further ahead than I even know because they're, they, that's how they work, that's how they roll. But um, that will be forthcoming. That that's very much in the works in terms of really broadcasting and making sure that the public knows this is out there and this is how they access it. Um, as for your question about the back end, so when folks come come, you know, some people you're right are not going to enjoy you know an interactive 
um, experience online and may just want to pick up the phone and call. So we do on our website also have a phone number for folks to call and we can give them help. The phone has, you know, it's been a little bit nutty. So um, we're, we're trying to, you know, again, assess what that looks like. And as we build our team out to deal with business recovery, um, or in, in, I shouldn't just say business recovery, just recovery, um, we can, can think about uh, expanding the phone availability if we need to. But we also have a, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, email that's set up specifically, it's a COVID-19 email for people to email in and ask whatever question it may be and they can connect with us. The third thing that I'm going to mention, I'm probably letting uh, letting this out of the the gate before you know I should, but we have been talking a little bit with the Agency of Digital Services about a chatbot. So um, I don't have a price tag or anything, but some of the other agencies, like the Department of Health, is using it and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But trying to just give another opportunity to create um, some some capacity help for when people have questions, this chatbot would you know, scrub everything on our website and give people answers and, and help that way. And if they're still not feeling like they have the help they need, then, you know, a live person can help them. But um, the other thing I should mention is, you know, we've talked about doing town halls. Um, I'm probably forgetting some things and I do, I think Jess might, yep, Jess is on the line too. So she may think of something I'm missing, but we're, we're definitely brainstorming about all the different ways that we can get the word out there and help and um, as I mentioned, I mean, I, Linda and Darcy have been incredibly helpful um, and great partners in this. I've learned a lot <laughs> in the last week. So um, so that's kind of what's going on right now. Okay. Uh, um, Michael, Michael, ahead. can I just ask a question? Um, Lindsay, thank you. And thank you for all your work. Uh, really terrific. Um, uh, Lynn, uh, Darcy Carter participated with us. Uh, we did a four chamber. We've now done three of these four chamber town halls on uh, four businesses. It, it strikes me doing a town hall that the chambers would publicize for you with you and Lynn yeah. and Darcy and uh, Linda on the phone. Uh, and it's fairly easy for people to ask questions in a thoughtful way. Um, I think that would be a great thing to do if if you were yeah. able. Yes, and I, you know what, I'm actually participating with a with a, the Vermont congressional delegation tonight in my first town hall experience with all this. Um, oh, okay. Uh, a little before five o'clock tonight, but it, I'm excited to do this because it'll give me the opportunity as well to uh, envision how our team can roll these out, you know, regularly. Right. And as you mentioned, I know the chamber will help us. These are great ideas. I. I I look forward to that experience and obviously joining that crew tonight. And, and Michael, Kyle, this is, um, oh, sorry, oh, go this ahead, is go ahead. I did want to tell you that um, the Department of Labor is doing a very like, small soft launch of a town hall this afternoon for businesses. Um, I think it's just, um, I think they're doing it with one business group as kind of a test. Um, but then publicizing them, hopefully we're going to be rolling those out and sending invites, you know, more publicly um, every Tuesday and Thursday for the next couple of weeks. So I'll make sure to get this group that link and that information, but they are testing that this afternoon. Oh, great. Great. And Lindsay, um, I appreciate that you're keeping this up to date. I know that this is evolving and things are changing all the time. One of the situations that I heard from uh, of from a constituent was that you know they checked the list of say essential workers at one time or their their employer did, and they were on the list and then they have subsequently been taken off the list, and. Um, I just hope that there's a way of telling people that they have to continue to check this um, this website because things are changing all the time. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think. There may I, I'm thinking there may be an example where there was a, a course correction at some point um, right out of the gate, and I can't remember what the exact incident is. But again, um, I think that you know, and this is part of our communications that we need to get out there is what we really want employers to use um, this guidance as is if they think they're critical, but they're not sure, and they're thinking about closing. What, what I think we, you know, did, which caused some confusion is I think folks thought they needed to get permission to stay open from us. And really what we're asking people is if you're not essential, please 
just shut it down right now. And um, so I appreciate what you're saying. And I, you know, I wish I could say there's no way that happened, but I do know there was an incident. It was within like an hour or two of putting the site up where somebody caught something that kind of had the barn door wide open and uh, and we closed that loophole. But you're right, if we, if we make a course correction and, and honestly, the intel that we get because of the outreach tells us where we have um, areas that we need to address. We know we have some loopholes and for the most part, even though those loopholes are open, people are willing to say like, I probably shouldn't be doing this, but others are using those loopholes as an opportunity to say, well, they left the door open, right? I'm gonna do it. So uh, uh, Deputy Secretary um, Brady and I were just talking about this this morning. I mean, we have a little running list of some of the things that we know we need to tighten up or make more consistent. Um, you know, we've created some inconsistent inconsistencies at times where we didn't intend to. And, you know, we've known like we have to keep working through this. But but like with the box store announcement, we'll try to make it clear if we're if in, in the box stores, it, box stores, it wasn't necessarily any it wasn't a course change. It was we realized people were interpreting something very loosely. Well, and, we and I, I think, you know, this has put some employees in awkward situations oh. where they've been told to go back to work oh and have chosen so i would be interested in hearing what that industry okay. or that sector was so we you know again we can maybe issue some help there um okay. but yeah no it's it's hard i mean i think some people are relieved when they realize like we shouldn't be open right it, it's like a relief to say i should be closed down i need to stay home and others want to fight it you know so Lizzie, um one of the things you mentioned when you were talking about the chat room, you sort, yeah. of, slipped, you sort of slipped in that sort of pricing it out and do yeah. it. So um, one of the, uh, what, what I hope you guys can do, especially in, in conjunction with this committee and with the uh, special task force is come to us with ideas that where the legislature can be of assistance. I mean, we're kind of clunky and you can move a lot faster, but we have control in large part over the purse strings. So one of the things, then there's a lot of money coming into the state that's discretionary. Yeah. Money. And this is not gonna last forever. It's gonna be a short-term thing. Right. Even though it might sound expensive upfront in the scheme of the amount of money we're getting, we might want to invest in these kinds of things and we can do that fairly okay. quickly. So we want to, one of the things I think that this task force, and I've talked very briefly uh, in my first call with Representative Marcotte is to figure out how we can help you with resources. So don't, don't limit yourself in terms of your thinking okay. saying, well, that's going to cost a half a million dollars. I and mean, surely we can't do that. Yeah. So, um, okay. Because that, that, that was actually, Michael, one of the questions that came in as we were gathering questions, which is uh, under the CARES Act, will Vermont be reimbursed for additional compensation, uh, administrative costs, uh, administrative costs, and that's exactly the kind of thing we'll be hopefully able to funnel your way on those kinds of things. Yeah. The yes. chat Oh, box. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I think what happens to me is I get a little bit like anxious thinking, okay, if we don't suck the money into the technology, then maybe we can create a program that fills a void, like a hole that's missing. You know, you know, can we, right. like I said, build programs that, that specifically go to the situation? But I agree. I mean, we have to be able to manage it and make people feel like, um, you know, just to, to shift gears and, and go to what's happening at, you know, in the unemployment insurance program. Like I'm, I'm incredibly amazed and proud of the team and what they've listed, lifted. But at the same time, um, there's a lot of frustration out there because the system is, it wasn't built to handle 40,000 claims in a week, you know? So um, so sometimes when I think about spending money, I'm like, oh, somebody else needs it more. But, but I hear you, I wanna make sure people, you know, the expectation is laid out there for them and that we're communicating and that we are, um, utilizing the technology technology that would make us communicate better. So I will keep that in mind and I really do appreciate you saying that to me. Okay, good. Um, so we should probably move on to Darcy 
and Linda, does anybody does anybody have any further questions for the secretary at this point? If you can if you can hang in there in the background, that would be great. But uh, if you have other things to do, I understand. Just you. no, uh, I'll hang in. It just quickly, uh, Lindsay. I assume that we uh, that Heather is available for sort of in and resort related questions because we're getting a bunch of them, particularly on this limiting on bookings. Yes. Yeah, so so just to like just to give you all some comfort on this, um, we are hearing what they are saying, and so I've asked um, uh, the Vermont Chamber has offered actually uh, they're going to put their heads together and and make a proposal for what would be a realistic date for them to open up their um, their their schedules, right? So I, you know, as, as you probably know, like when we take down the whole online, people can't book out into the future. So if we were to let the online come back on, but we, we really want people to block certain dates. So there in the next few days, they'll come back with something. And um, so I just want you all to know, like we hear, we hear and heard that concern. And, and this is one more of those, um, areas where we can um, still get to our goal, but give in owners and restaurants, I mean, uh, hotels and, and whatnot, the, the comfort of knowing that when this is lifted, they can be back, you know, to business. So, uh, but yeah, so Heather, Heather's available as well. And, and she's, you know, obviously been, <laughs> been very dialed into what's going on there. Great. <coughs> okay. Anybody else? Okay, uh, so uh, um, Linda and Darcy, uh, maybe you can tag team here. Uh, we'll start with Darcy um, and maybe you can give us an overview from the SBA's perspective of what's happening in the real world out there at this point. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to. Um, everybody has been trying to get the word out, and so the word has gotten pretty confusing for a lot of people. So uh, I know Linda and Lindsay and her team and I, um, we're all spending a lot of time trying to help people decide what they should do between the two SBA programs that are available. Um, one of them, of course, is this Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. That's been available for um, a couple of weeks. It had some hiccups initially. Now it's got a better streamlined um, application. We were going to do webinars on it, but we kind of pulled back until the system got um, expanded. So we're going to start those next week. And those will be oh, for great. the public. Maybe, yeah, those will be for the public. Maybe, we'll just keep redoing them. Maybe you can just give us a brief outline of that program. Oh, absolutely. Um, so this is a program that you apply directly to SBA. It's up to $2 million for um, businesses and nonprofits. It's very limited for any ag. You could do some value added ag only on that program. And I think it's because they feel that FSA handles that side of the house. Um, so it's, again, nonprofits, small businesses, including sole proprietors, self-employed, independent contractors, and our, you know, regular businesses. And um, the interest rate is 3.75 fixed for up to 30 years for businesses, 2.75% um, up for 30 years, again, for nonprofits. And this is to help replace operating expenses for about six months. So what they will look at is what were your, you know, what was your gross margin um, last year? And they're basically giving you half of it to try to help replace what you lost due to the lost revenues from the disaster. So that's a very standard program, and that was up and running prior to CARES Act passing. So once the CARES Act passed, um, up pops this um, thing that's called an advance and sometimes called a grant. Um, so there's an ability now when you apply to request an advance. And everything we've seen, and we are still waiting for more information, is that this up to $10,000 amount would be converted to a grant. So... That sounds very good, but we don't know the mechanics of it yet, and that's what everyone wants to know. So we're just encouraging people to go ahead and apply, request it. They will be calling from the Office of Disaster Assistance when they pull up your loan, and then you'll have that opportunity to, to find out how it all works and what you want. You know, do you want it or you don't want it? Um, we have expanded our call um, center. We uh, contracted it out. That was an issue, so now we're we have 24-7 coverage, and um, 
that's, you know, hopefully going to get up to about 7,000 people manning that, that system, which will be very helpful. We've gotten, as of Monday, over 300,000 applications. Are you taking yeah, nationally. Are you taking applications? Okay. Are you taking applications right now? Yeah, yes. for the, it's called EIDL. Yep. And so you go right to SBA's website. So it's and, like sba.gov forward slash disaster. And, and there is. Online. Yep. Yep. And it's actually working now. <laughs> Last week, uh, not so much. So um, it just got basically overloaded with the with the interest. I mean, you've got 10 million people unemployed. I mean, there's there's almost that many business owners that are trying to find the capital and, you know, help that they need. So that program is um, up and running, um, but we do encourage people to look at the newer program that came out as part of the CARES Act that Lindsay mentioned. It's called the um, Paycheck Protection Program, PPP. And this is helping to replace your payroll that you basically couldn't cover. And so you either let your people go or um, you're retaining them. Either way, it's been painful financially. So this is to help replenish about eight weeks of your payroll expenses, which includes more than just the actual salary and wages. It includes, you know, medical leave, um, you know, sick leave, vacation time, um, your rent, your utilities. So it's kind of a, a bigger uh, number there. And the loan can give you basically 250% of your payroll for eight weeks. So it's a little padding in there to, I guess, you know, some people were asking, could they, you know, give people a bonus to come back? Because for some, you know, positions, the unemployment is actually paying a little bit more for a, for a bit. So we hope, we're trying to get clarification on that, but we hope that that is something employers could do. And um, this program is open to farmers and ranchers, we've heard. And it's also open for nonprofits and um, small businesses, and it has a much bigger size standard um, available. So it's based mostly on um, 500 employees. And for lodging and restaurant, it's 500 employees per location. So if you have a, you know, a lodging or a restaurant um, corporation that has some locations in Vermont, but they have them elsewhere, um, they hopefully could be helped by this program. They wouldn't be considered too big for it. So that was a special carve out for them. Um, some of the concerns that we have right now is that we don't have a lot of clarification on um, how the banks will actually uh, roll out the PPP loan. It will be banks and credit unions. Um, VITA will be able to do it. And they really just need some information from SBA. Our understanding is that it's in clearance, that it's been written. And this would basically tell them eligibility rules very clearly, how they determine the loan amount and how they process that loan with us. And the banks do have unilateral authority to make the credit decision, but the onus is on them to follow the rules and, and make those determinations. So we've noticed in our system, they're already approved to do PPP loans. So it looks like the, the switch is ready to go go live as soon as they get the details. So hopefully that's gonna you know, come even today and hopefully by tomorrow because the banks and credit unions are all getting just as many calls as Lindsay's team is and we are um, with people interested in that program. I don't know well, if you need any more of the nitty gritty, but. I just had one question of what you said, which I was a little confused on. Um, is it possible for an employer to qualify for PPP to cover their payroll and at the same time tell their employees you are you can go qualify for unemployment benefits so the the, the money it's sort of like a uh, two sources of funding to pay payroll one unemployment and one actual covering the payroll costs Right, and then there's like a tax credit too, right? Payroll tax credit. Um, that I would have to admit I am not um, up to speed on, so I should probably um, look up, you know, that answer for you because we're just dealing with the employer trying to um, get the money to bring their people back by June 30th. That's what the PPP loan program is for. Typically, it, with disaster type loans, we do look at other benefits and we try not to have any duplication. But I don't really know. We haven't seen anything about that 
with what we've seen on the PPP program. I don't know if Lindsay's probably much more able to talk to that question if she's still on. It's, um, I'm still on. Tell me what the question is again. Question is, um, yeah. can, can a business qualify for PPP at the same time during that oh. period, that payroll period, the, they lay off their workers, the workers collect unemployment, and then by June 30th, they rehire the workers. So you basically have almost a doubling of payroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I would imagine actually that may be a question for, you know, Darcy or somebody else. But what I would say is generally you can't collect unemployment and, you know, get paid somewhere else. So if they take the PPP and they're not paying their employees because their employees are collecting unemployment, um, they may be able to get the loan, but I, I can't imagine that it would be forgiven. I don't know how somebody checks that. But I think that's a really great question. Um, maybe maybe Darcy has an answer to that. Well, I think it's there, there's a set period of time that you're that you're that's <laughs> called the covered period. So if you bring people back and pay them for that covered period of time, it's eight weeks. So then you would be in compliance with the SBA loan. So part of that time, you know, it's kind of kind of hard to say um, when those people aren't there. Um, if that's part of the, the eight weeks, then you've got an issue, like Lindsay said, because you can't say I paid my people for all of those eight weeks. And that's the requirement in order to have um, that amount forgiven in the loan program. The uh, other thing I will okay, say yeah. is with unemployment, you have to re report what your earnings are for a week. So even if you get partial earnings, you have to report that. So if, if a company is paying their employees through PPE and their employee is also trying to you know, collect unemployment, hopefully if the system's operating well, it's going to catch that and it's going to prevent them from getting the unemployment uh, benefit that, you know, that week, or it's going to reduce it by what they, they did get. So. Yeah, yeah. Right. And the employer wouldn't get the full forgiveness of that payroll amount if they didn't bring everybody back full time. Got it. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah, so the, May I just ask, because Darcy, that's what's confusing about what you first said is that you could have choices of either letting your employees go or retaining them. Well, you it doesn't sound like you can let them go and also ask to keep paying them. I mean, it, it doesn't sound like actually you can do both those things at the same time. No, it's just some people, some people have already let their people go and some people have retained theirs. So Got both it. of so, those scenarios, you'd be eligible to apply for the loan. So for um, the period, so for the period the employees are have been let go, they're able to collect unemployment with the with the uh, additional benefit. Then they get brought on, back on, and then they fall under the PPP. Well, yeah, I mean, our our whatever I've seen is silent on that whole other side that you guys are much more knowledgeable about. So. Um, it's, you bring up a really good point. Ours doesn't speak to that at all. It just says, you know, for, they calculate the eight weeks of payroll expenses largely based on what you did last year. And if you bring all, all that, those people back and pay that same amount of wages for eight weeks, then you will get that amount of the loan forgiven. So what the devil's in the details in terms of what period, which eight weeks, what are we talking about? So I think it begins when they've, when they've gotten the loan that then right. they have to count those eight weeks going forward. And once they've done that, improved with their IRS payroll taxes or whatever documentation that they've done it, then they ask the bank to forgive it. And then the bank can ask us to purchase the loan. So um, Darcy and Linda, going back to the conversation we had with the commissioner, the secretary, excuse me. Um, are we, I know you have your own role and your, own outreach and you're taking calls, but are we at a point where your federal agency uh, is in sync with ACCD so that um, if they've got the best tool at this point to refer people to uh, is on your website or on your phone call is the first avenue to say, go to this ACCD page, it's great, it works, and uh, you'll eventually, if, if we're involved, we'll eventually, you'll come back to us because I mean, I can see you 
duplicating that effort with different font, different typeset, different wording, and maybe even different interpretations. And uh, I think we've gotten to the point where everybody has trying to be very earnest to try and help constituents and people. And, uh, you know, I think we have found out that maybe we should have tried to tell people as the governor did yesterday, we gotta be patient here. You know, information's coming from the feds, guidelines are coming and um, we need to get our act together in one place or in one message. So I'm wondering uh, whether we've got a lot of different silos out there where people are giving out information. So, uh, uh, you that's know, a great point. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll take a stab at this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think, so personally, I think that our teams, you know, are working really well together. Um, I look at our job, as you mentioned, to be a place where a, an individual or an employer can go. They don't have to sort of like be thinking other than like, I've been hit, I need resources here. So they can go to our page and we're trying to drive them as appropriate to the other landing areas. So to the SBA or to Vita or, you know, wherever it may be. And so I, like I said, I know that, you know, Linda and Darcy and I, we've, we've connected, but I know they're also working a lot with, with uh, Joan and the team over at in DD, DED and, um, so it is our goal, our personal goal, to push people to our web page. And you know, if if somebody thinks that that is not the appropriate path, or we're stepping on toes or something, I would, you know, I certainly want somebody to speak up. But I mean, we're about to, you know, we'll be issuing additional press releases and and announcing the page in addition to what happened, you know, yesterday. Because in my mind, like we announced it yesterday, but it was a long, you know, it was almost a two-hour press conference, and I'm sure some people checked right out after ten minutes. So. Um, we're going to be getting the word out more. But would you agree, Darcy and Linda, do you feel like we're on the right track, that we're pushing people through to you as appropriate? Yes, and we're referring everybody to your website. Um, okay. From day one, when we knew about it, we were sending them to the, you know, sign up for the newsletter. Um, this is where you need to go because we don't cover like the unemployment, you know, things and all the other good stuff you've got on there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Sure. So good, good morning, everybody. Oh, Allison, did you want to say something first? No, is that Linda? This is Linda. I, I yeah. just wanted to read from my screen. So um, I'm, I'm off video for the moment. I'll be back, but I'm- Well, I just, I just wanted to tag on to Michael's question, which is the, and Darcy referred to it briefly, which is the, the, the time frame for the flow of money and for the standing up of these programs. We're all saying have patience. Uh, and, but I thought I heard Darcy say that she felt that the PPP program would have enough federal guidance to be able to stand up by next week and you'd be rolling out webinars for people in that would coincide with that, uh, it going live. Um, yes, we well, we can definitely cover EIDL and we can cover the PPP, all the, you know, everything we've got now, and hopefully we will have more information so that we would have some of the clarifying information that people are looking for on that program. Well, but my sense from you is that for the time frame that the EI uh, DL is up and going. That that is yes. live. What is yep. not live yet is the PPP, and and there's still some federal guidance being worked out. But that next week it sounds like it might be live, and you would make it live, sort of announce its liveness, its living breathingness. Uh, in, <laughs> by having these web webinars. Right, and basically the way, it's kind of behind the scenes a little bit because the banks just internally know how to work with SBA and how to submit something through our system already for just normal good time lending. Um, so they're right. already geared up to go. They know what to do from that standpoint. Um, there might be a couple tweaks and you know, how they code it or something like that in our system, especially for PPP. But, you know, in our system, they've all been approved already to submit PPP loans. And our eTrans system that they submit to has already got a new code for that. So I think a lot of the groundwork has been laid. And what needs to be communicated to the lender, particularly, is how do they determine who is eligible for this loan? 
there's, you know, certain criteria. It's not a huge long list, but, you know, I have to make sure they were in business before the disaster. They have to make sure, um, you know, that they got determined the payroll expense amount to determine the loan, things like that. And, um, but they make that credit decision. So literally if they get the guidance on Friday, you know, they can make a loan Friday. They get it on Monday, they could make it on Monday. So are you suggesting that people who are interested in the PPP program should be, is it a dual application that you apply both to your lender and to SBA? Or is there one um, there application is. and then it gets sent to the lender? Right, there's an application right now for the PPP program that's on our website. So a, a borrower or a lender can take a look at it. And I mean, they can get started to put some information together and, and fill it out so that they can maybe hurry things up a little bit. They can talk with their lender. Many of them have already approached their lender and the lender's like, I, you know, I want to help you, but I'm waiting for some information from SBA. So there's been a lot of conversation going on already. And the other important thing is you can apply for both loans. You can apply for an EIDL and you can apply for the PPP loan. That's where a lot of confusion is because people don't know which one is better for them. And things have changed a little bit on the PPP loan. It started out with a 10 year maturity. Now it's only two years. So that's a big difference. If you know some of your loans not forgiven, a two year maturity date, if you have a large payroll, that, that's gonna be challenging. If for some reason you couldn't bring, bring everybody back, you know, it may not be your fault. Maybe you couldn't, you know, just cash flow otherwise, other issues going on, you couldn't do it. Then you're stuck with a loan, not a forgiven loan. And um, people need to be aware of that, that that's, you know, you, you can't predict everything in this pandemic. Like that, that's a risk in that kind of loan situation. With EIDL, you don't get as much potentially forgiven, but I think it seems like it's a bit more of a, it's more clear what it is you're getting. W what can you use the money for? Um, there isn't that, oh, you know, I've got to produce all this documentation kind of situation. And the PPP, hey, Darcy, that help. No. can the PPP uh, application uh, be dated retroactively to the time of payroll you want to cover that you, uh, or is it just prospective from the date of application? Oh, sorry, I'm still working with my husband. So it's a little bit of nice. Um, can you repeat the question? It goes back from, your question and was, when does the cover period start? Yes, how, how can you go backwards retroactively and cover some payroll with the PPP loan? Or is it just from the date you get your application in? Um, well, yeah, it's kind of, that's where we want a little more clarity because it talks about this time period in, from like February, I think it's 15th to June 30th is this covered period. And that's kind of like, it's a little hard for me to understand. <laughs> Linda kind of has more of an idea on it, but it's it's eight weeks of payroll that you're trying to calculate based on past payroll. And that's what you're trying to replenish. And you have to bring your people back by June 30th, according to current rules that we've seen. Um, and you have to pay them for eight weeks in order to get that money forgiven. So I don't, I don't know if the ret I don't know if the retroactive part applies other than it, it could calculate what your average monthly payroll expense is because you can use kind of the first quarter of this year if, if they, you don't use last year to determine that. So that's what's confusing would, for everybody. Would that complicate? Whoops, am I on? Um, would that complicate issues as people have been sent home and then started collecting UI and then um, the employer decides to go with the PPP loan? I mean, does that make that kind of double dipping an issue? That part I don't really know other than ours would start like when they get the money is when they would count those eight weeks of, of payroll that they're paying. It so, starts when they get the loan and yeah. goes forward in time. So I don't I don't know because there's so, going to be probably like you said some overlap with maybe not everybody coming back full time. Um, so it's going to get it's going to get complicated <laughs> to figure some of that out and whether or not IRS or the state or the feds whatever look at this as somewhat of a double dipping situation. 
So Darcy, can you clarify for our committee um, what, as we go forward and we get this clarification and things start running smoothly, we hope, um, what is the role of the SBA dealing with Vermonters and the SBDC dealing with Vermonters and the banks in dealing with Vermonters? Are they like portals that you can enter from any one of those three or are you just a referral agency to say what banks um, are, are enrolled in the program or are processing claims and what kind of volume are you are the two of your organizations sort of seeing now? Um, no, this is just such a great question. So yeah. it's it's kind of everybody comes at every door and we refer people appropriately. Like we we have two customers. One is our is our lending participants and we train them and keep them up to date on what they need to do to make SBA loans. So we're going to train them on these new programs and there'll be some new lenders that join us and um, there's quite a you know a lot of different things they need to do um, to use the program but we also do outreach to the public a lot and then we work closely with SBDC and our Women's Business Center and the SCORE because um, those are SBA programs and um, we refer people constantly to them to help prepare them for their loan program, the loan package they're trying to get together for that holistic look you know, is a loan appropriate for me? What, you know, what else is going on in my business? And Linda will, will talk to this. So we're tightly, um, you know, hooked together. And then of course, ACCD as well. So I think you can feel very confident. We're talking with each other constantly, especially this week. <laughs> we've all been on the same phone call, I think for a week straight. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going to refer people where they need to go. Like, I don't think people will feel that they didn't get the right you know, referral. So, so do you, and, and it is have, important. You, I'd you be have happy a, to. You have a physical have, office. You have a physical off, office in Vermont where people can walk in. Yes, we do. SBA does in Montpelier. Of course, now you know we can't. But okay, okay. But uh, in the so in the normal course of things, could somebody? Uh, it sounds like a naive question, but can somebody walk into your office or an SBDC office? In addition to getting advice as to what programs are out and the appropriateness for that particular business, could they walk out of there having filed an application for a loan? Um, not with us at SBA. I don't know if Linda does. I'll have, to have her answer that. Yeah, she's she's been trying to get in. That's okay. Um, I'm taking good notes. Thank you all. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I'll try to start with a couple things that I've heard are kind of main parts of the conversation, and maybe that'll help give you uh, a kind of a picture for uh, the time being. Um, on the communication and messaging front, I will say that um, we're working very closely with SBA as well as the agency. And in fact, what we do is in order to streamline the communication, uh, the agency's uh, web flows through, like the secretary said, to us. And so what we do is we, every uh, week, if not more often, we update our special, it's vtsbdc.org forward slash coronavirus. And we update that page with new information as it comes about, which is in the realm of here are things that a business owner can do now. And it's you know taking control of the things that they have control over in a very uncertain time, preparing financials, um, negotiating the debts they already have, reviewing their insurance policy about whether there's pandemic clauses, um, looking ahead at both the loan now that is available for people to apply for and getting ready for the one that's coming. So I would say um, to kind of put it in a nutshell, if it helps you sort of have a sense of the who does what, I look at SBA and all the other agencies as describing the what of the program. So a lot of the communication that happened since Friday was congressional memos and really good information how we viewed of the intent of the CARES Act to be implemented 
And then it needed a few days for the individual responsible agencies to then stand up their own programs and make them available to the public. So the agencies are the what of their own program, which we're staying in tune with so we know the rules and the details to give clear guidance. SBDC is all about should you, how to, and when. And a lot of that is the interrelationship between these loan programs. Many small businesses who were right on the verge of being viable or, or not before COVID-19 came to town are not really excited about taking on debt unless it's you know, a grant only and things like that. So our role as we go through this is to listen to the individual case by case situation. And the last two weeks, we've gotten great insight into how those fall into several buckets of questions. And so just to kind of recap on the messaging, I think what's working very well is every time we update our page, the agency's nightly email to their massive list and their website page funnels people to our page that we're updating all the time anyway. So people who are getting through that funnel of how they're receiving information, it is coordinated. Um, every week, so last week we put together, and this was a collaboration with the 12 RDCs in Vermont and with Joan and Ted and the team at the agency and DED is, we put together, and it's authored by SBDC, um, and this is just, as we sift through information, here's our best guidance, things that are coming, things that are available, things that you can do now. Um, and so we put it together, it's called Disaster Business. It was 101, this week it's 201, and we're starting on 301. And um, you know, I'd be happy to make sure that your committee is notified when those updated documents are, are published. But I think that you, to your point about working with larger groups like trade associations and chambers so that we're all as consistent as possible with giving guidance on what people can do now and what while they have to be a little patient on things that aren't ready to apply for yet, there's still things that we know they can do. We have a checklist of financials and things that we can work on with them. Um, and so we know that the three buckets are essential businesses and workers, workforce, labor, unemployment is kind of that second, and then the access to new money. So every day we're making sure that we know uh, more and more clarity about the available capital, loans, financing choices, so that we don't publish anything and recommend it until we feel it's sound. Um, and I'll stop there in case you have questions, but I actually on the PPP, I'll just say that I'm leaning towards our guidance being, please consider the PPP on the merits as if it was a loan, because you don't know now for everyone what June 30th is going to look like. It will be awesome if it's all forgiven or or even partially forgiven but we don't want people to make the application with that as a guarantee so you know we're going to be looking at the the realistic should you how to do it and i guess just a, a one more piece is again we're learning more and the volume just to give you a sense in a given year sbdc about 600, 625 individual Vermont small businesses through one-on-one -on -one advising. We've got another 650 that we're in touch with in the last two weeks. So what does that mean? That means that we're figuring out how to batch information, deliver it in short chunks of triage style, 15 to 30 minute phone calls because that's a more effective way along with these joint communications with key partners and industry groups um, so that we can deliver information and help as many Vermonters as possible. Is all your funding 
through, I know you get your funding uh, that gets passed through uh, Vermont, Vermont Technical College, but, uh, or I think I do, is that all federal dollars or is there some state dollars? It's a great that... question. Um, so yeah, just, just for clarity for folks, we are a program, a department, if you will, of the Vermont State College system. So we're education. Um, our funding comes in part federal through SBA and in part state through the Agency of Commerce as matching dollars. We know that SBDCs nationwide are poised to get significant dollars as part of the CARES Act. There is a process to apply for it. We know it's available. We just need to go through a process to make sure that you know there's performance measures and good documentation. So we expect that will be in place in the next couple of months. Um, and that will allow us to uh, add capacity and build more infrastructure for, I think, the longer term response, recovery and resilience phases. Um, right now, this month, next month, uh, we're working and uh, coming up with our own continued improvement systems like everyone is, as we know what that volume looks like and what those key questions and how we can add the most value so we can give clear guidance to Vermonters. Okay, so one question, um, straightforward one that I was still not clear on is, can somebody come to your office and apply for PPP? So we provide the guidance and advice about what it is, how to apply, what documents to get ready in order to apply. Our entire team is not working in an office um, where they would normally, they're virtually giving advice. Zoom, email, phone calls, but they're all available and they transition to virtual advising um, on March 16th. So no place to walk in, but very accessible. But but there's just Ross Hart for my neck of the woods and, and just Deb in the, I mean, are, are they getting some additional help? So right now, our current team, which is the same team pre-COVID-19, is six full-time advisors and two part-time for the state of Vermont. Right. So um, I have a part-time consultant I brought on yesterday, and here's what she's doing. She's going to be our version of the incoming, the first step in the triage, so that she can take the people who have general questions and want general guidance so that all of the incoming doesn't go to the Ross Hearts and the Deb Boudrios to answer FAQs, if you will. So that is gonna be a step in the right direction. Um, I'm looking to work with the rest of our um, you know, partners and say, how can we best deploy resources um, so that we can make our advising team as effective so they can stay in the realm of one-on-one -on -one and not as much in the messaging and. I'm happy to go on webinars and, you know, other other things that allow me to speak for the whole team and keep them in the realm of serving more Vermonters. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's a small group. Um, but I will say the good news is everyone has been res has been responded to within about 48 hours. H adding this consultant on who came on board yesterday we will make sure that people get responded to as quickly as possible. And actually, for the most part, small business owners have been very grateful to have someone that they can share their story with who listens and provides some short next steps for now. And as long as we hear them and we talk to them, they're able to be more patient for a few more days before they see it, real programs available for them to access. So it's a good question. I'm looking at what's the best way to add capacity as we move from the short term to the longer term. And I'm happy to stay in touch with you about those things. So I think I know the answer to this question, but let me pose it as a frequently asked question. Can I online at this point, in addition to getting your help, actually file an application with you for a loan with you or the SBA, or do I, do I have to do that through a lending institution? So two, two things. We help you navigate the system, but we, we don't have, it's not, we're not a lending institution, we're an advising body. Wow. Uh, so we will 
so we provide the advice and the guidance and the checklist of documents, but the individual business owner will fill out the application. And right now today, EIDL and its partner EEIG as the application for up to 10,000 as the grant advance, those are available right now. And so business owners can apply online if they have questions and they wanna ask our advice about should they and how to and all of those things, they can contact the area advisor of SBDC for those questions. But the business owner themselves will apply for the loan. And then once the PPP gets stood up at the individual Vermont banks, that is something, again, we'll provide guidance about advice on should you, how to evaluate your financial condition overall, take everything in totality. What we don't want to do is give people advice to apply for one thing that then down the road somehow negates their ability to do something and they wish they knew about it. So we're trying to look at advising in a more holistic approach, um, but the banks are going to be the vehicle for the PPP and the business owner is going to be the person who applies for the loan directly through the online sources and portals. So the online sources and portals where you can apply is an online source of the People's Bank or Citizens United. That's where you're saying they go online to apply. And Darcy's team at SBA is going to, once that SBA policy notice comes out, the banks will know how to make their program available to the public. And that's what she said is going to be through webinars to the public next week. So again, we don't apply for the loans on behalf of people. People apply for them as the small business owner themselves, but we provide advice, guidance, tips, checklist of documents required, and all of that. Does that help? Yes. Does anybody have any questions uh, at this point? I, we got a message that our next group of witnesses was in the governor's office and they were gonna be delayed. I don't know if they've joined us or not. Uh, Denise or Faith, do you know if any of those witnesses are on at this point? This is Faith. I don't see any of those witnesses having joined the call yet. Okay, so we can continue on a little bit. I so apologize. I have to go for another meeting. Oh, really? <laughs> We're shocked. <laughs> Sorry, I hate to say it. <laughs> I'm not going to go very far from your chair. And though. by the way, I want to say thank you because by being on this call with with Linda and Darcy as well, like there's a couple things that clicked for me that I need to bolster. So good. this is a huge help to me. Great. Well, that's <laughs> good to hear. So, uh, <laughs> I'm learning every minute. We, we right, all thank are. you, everyone. We all are. We're all in the same classroom. I know. <laughs> nice um, to see your faces. Thank you. It's great to see yours, Lindsay. Thanks thank so you. much. Bye, everyone. Uh, Linda and Darcy. <laughs> I, I have a, a concern and it's it, it can't just be Woodstock, but the TD Bank office here has closed. So it, it, you're saying that so many of these programs depend on partnering and working with their banks, with their lenders. I'm very concerned that some of the banks are uh, closing up their local shops and um, not as available uh, and not as accessible as they might be in the past. And this is Darcy. Um, well, they are all working, um, Senator, and um, it, the lobby is closed. So you're right; it has the appearance of nobody being there. But oh, they, nobody, um, nobody's they... nobody's there. I mean, and and, and because it's anyway, uh, I guess they just have to call the whatever is open and establish a new relationship with a new lender individually because. That's that's a problem right now for some banks, I would think. Yeah, I'm, I've been talking with them about that. I said, well, you know, you normally deal in person with commercial loans. You know, how are you going to handle the PPP loan? Can you do it digitally? Can people sign digitally? Can, you know, you exchange documents and all of that? And they can do that on the consumer side. They just haven't typically done it on the commercial side. And most of them were still like, oh, oh, yeah, you're right, huh? 
So I think that they've been thinking about it at least this week, how they're going to, you know, get their act together from that standpoint in terms of um, being more um, paperless. Uh, But they still do Zoom and things like that. And um, they've assured me they're all working. So I, I don't know about that one branch if they closed it down. Is that what you said, Senator? Uh, they've temporarily closed it completely. And so okay. it, it's a challenge. I've heard from a number of businesses that it's a challenge. They don't know individually who to email or who to be in touch with. And the phone that they, they've been sent, we've been re- all of us have been referred to the Rutland branch. Anyway, it's not an issue for you so much, although it is as it relates to the lender uh, interface. Yeah, because- I'm gonna, I'll let the bank president know that because that's a really good point now that people yeah, are really I, looking to, to Chris apply Celia, but it's a it's 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 an on it's a, a it's an ongoing frustration particularly with these programs that are lender dependent so I, yeah, I hear you imagine, yeah i would imagine darcy that the the lenders will when they have their application and they communicate out to the public about how to apply they'll include the information about virtual access and the process in light of uh, physical branch lobbies and such being closed? Mm -hmm. They're going to have to. I mean, right now, like we're trying to refinance our house and they're like, go up to the drive-thru and you put the documents in the thing, you know, and then they said, or someone can meet you at the door and you can hand them to them. Uh, So they're, they're trying to still make it work. So I, I have confidence that that'll get sorted out, but it's a great question um, because they were caught kind of like, oh, yeah, oh, you're right. Yeah. May I ask a question at this point? Yes. Sure. Uh, I'm wondering what kind of feedback you're getting uh, as far as the SBDC, as well as the SBA, as well as lenders in terms of their accessibility and whether or not uh, you're hearing uh, comments or complaints or uh, questions from people who simply aren't able to get through or are not able to get their questions answered, or are you hearing that everything is going entirely smoothly? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, this is Darcy. I would say that the volume is um, exceptionally high in all respects um, on the SBA side, like unprecedented. So we're trying to get back to people with this within the same day, but it's often within the 48 hours, I would say, with the contact with the questions that we're getting. And are people anticipating that there will be that kind of delay? Uh, uh, in other words, are the phone messages and so on uh, that uh, are, are on the lines indicating that there will be a 24 hour or approximately we'll get back to you in a day or two of what kind of communication is being given to set expectations? For SBA, just locally, we have um, put on our emails um, something to that effect. And then we refer people to our customer service number for the disaster loan program. And that's open 24 seven. Yeah, and this is Linda. I I would just say that our main number in Randolph that is monitored, we've adjusted the voice message to give people um, a sense of the expectations and our website has a special COVID-19 and just, you know, we're not putting a certain number of business hours uh, that we'll be getting back to people, uh, but we do say that we're working hard to get back to them just as soon as possible, but we give them the direction on that site that says, here's what you can do now. Here's how SBDC um, advisors can help you. And it gives them some actionable steps that they can take while um, they're looking forward to having a one-on-one engagement with an advisor. But it, like we said, I think the because this is so massive, you know, there's not a small business in Vermont that's untouched. There are certain industries more than others. Um, people, people are appreciative of, of being called back and having the conversation, even if we don't have all the answers yet. So I think with this extra consulting um, on board, we'll be able to have those conversations sooner, even if then people's expectations about some one-on-one work take, take another day or two. Um, it, yeah, we're, like I said, in two weeks, we've had about the same volume we would have in a year. So 
um, it's, it's a challenge. We're doing the best and we're learning from the experiences how to be better at delivering common information that most people want answers to so that we avoid the bottleneck to the best degree possible. Thank you. Okay, um, I think if there's no other questions, is Damien, I see Damien. Uh, we're still waiting for our other witnesses, but you were gonna do cleanup uh, today. So maybe we can change the order and you can give us some of your insights in terms of um, the CARES Act and its intent in terms of some of the thornier issues that I'm sure you've heard repeatedly both today and uh, earlier in the week. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning Damien. So um, I guess before I get started, one question that was posed to me uh, at the end of the last meeting was um, whether um, whether we could reduce the reimbursement requirement for nonprofit organizations? Um, the answer is we can't. Um, that's part of our federal conformity requirements is that they reimburse the full cost of the unemployment uh, compensation paid out to individuals who have been laid off. And I think that's why the CARES Act structured uh, the 50% reduction in that as a reimbursement to the nonprofits. So in other words, they pay the full amount due um, for unemployment compensation benefits paid out to their uh, employees who have been laid off. And then after that, they'll get a 50% reimbursement in federal dollars. So if we wanted to address that issue going forward for those employers, um, it, we basically have to come up with a separate pool of state dollars um, to then provide some sort of subsidy to them. Uh, only, only one state allows them to um, be non-chargeable for certain benefits, but it's on the basis of their paying in actually a portion of the unemployment insurance tax uh, continuously. So they don't allow people to be fully reimbursing. It's like a hybrid setup in that state. Um, so for our state, uh, we could potentially explore revising the law going forward, but at this point, the best relief we could provide to them if, if it's even on the table and there's funds available is some sort of uh, reimbursement to the nonprofits for the amounts that they have to pay out. Um, so that, I guess, is not very good news, but um, that's where, where things stand, unfortunately. But it, it um, goes back to the question that we were talking about before you came on, which is admin additional costs that aren't necessarily specifically allocated by the feds that we may need or that we may want to make those choices about. And uh, it'll be a good question as to what's flexible money coming into us and what isn't because these nonprofits are all small businesses and and to me the interplay of their ui getting only reimbursed 50 percent which is a, a challenge and what they're eligible for and i mean could they be totally made whole through the ppp program would it you know so so they uh, the PPP program does not cover unemployment insurance Right, I, I understand that, um, but but it does but cover their potentially. Right, they they could potentially use the PPP program to, um, basically, uh, as a forgivable loan to get them across the gap. Um, the catch is there's a little bit of uncertainty depending on how long things are shut down for. Um, so if you're going to pay people to keep them on um, and you're using it basically, I mean, you can get forgiveness for rent or mortgage interest, uh, payroll costs and um, utilities costs. Um, and so they could use it for all of those things. Um, but the, 
the thing is, is it's eight weeks from the origination of the loan. After that, those costs aren't forgivable. So they could estimate what those costs will be for the next two months, but then they may still be in this place two months from now if the economy hasn't gotten restarted. Um, I think we're all hoping that the shutdown won't take us, uh, let's see, that would be into the beginning of June. I think we're all hopeful that things will be winding up by then or, or already wound up, but um, that is kind of one of the questions. So the PPP program is there. Um, there is potentially a little bit of a delay um, just in terms of the time it takes to process the application and to get the money. Um, so that's another concern for those entities. Um, there is the, uh, I have to look to double check uh, um, the language of the bill, but there's also the um, Oh gosh, um, the EIDL grants, um, which is basically the advance of $10,000 on your EIDL loan. Um, and that advance of $10,000 is a grant, uh, even if your EIDL loan is changed over to a PPP loan. Um, I think the catch on the EIDL is it's a little bit higher interest rate and right. I don't know the extent to which nonprofits qualify for it. Um, they they qualify and they pay a lower rate. They pay a 2.7 something rate versus the 3.7 rate. Okay. Damien, so it, there seems, you go. it seems, Damien, it seems like um, for the most part, it's a very viable, you understand in that at least buys time for eight weeks and can relieve the nonprofits of the 100% uh, reimbursement of unemployment costs because they could just take the money as a loan, ultimately convert it to a grant and pay people payroll, not lay them off and have them work from home or have them do nothing, but still pay, make their payroll. The question, I guess, I have, you said something about a delay and we all anticipate delay and the need for patience. What's the federal law in terms of the timing of interest and penalty on um, if they did have some layoffs for a few weeks and you didn't submit their reimbursable bills? How long does it take for the state to get a bill out to these people? When do they have to pay it back and can the state forgive any interest and penalties on uh, paying, uh, paying that uh, reimbursement? So um, the, the bills for reimbursable employers are sent on a quarterly basis. Um, so you'll get a quarterly bill for all of the unemployments paid out uh, in that quarter. Um, part of the um, CARES Act, there was direction to the US DOL to provide guidance to state departments on uh, basically providing additional flexibility around payments uh, and reimbursement to the fund. I would have to look at the um, discretion that we grant the commissioner for late payments, um, but I would I would imagine that there is some flexibility there already. And if necessary, we could grant some temporary uh, additional flexibility or, or waive penalties and that sort of thing temporarily. Um, but I'd have to look into that. I can make a note to just kind of address the issue of um, what interest and penalty provisions there are and any changes we might need to make if there's not enough flexibility in those statutes. And it would seem at the very least, another option would be that we could set up a temporary interest-free loan with state funds to pay, pay the 50% um, uh, the um, of the, of the, uh, reimbursement that they have to make to the UI trust fund, because unless somebody makes that payment, you're leaving federal dollars on the table 
that could come back. So want that money and have some sort of lean on the money that when the Fed money comes in, it comes back to the state. Uh, it, would, it, it would be a case if we didn't do something like that, we'd be leave, leaving a lot of federal dollars on the table. It might not solve the problem for the nonprofits that need 100% reimbursement, but at least we would have access to the 50% and not lose that because of the cash flow problem by the nonprofits. Yeah, and I think uh, if you set something like that up, um, as long as the funds come from sort of state general fund dollars and not from the UI trust fund, then you're free to set up uh, any sort of program that you want along those lines. And I could work with uh, David to set that up. Okay. Great. Anything uh, else that jumps out at you at this point? I guess one question to keep the conversation going, but we need to answer it. And I don't know if any of our other witnesses have joined us yet, because they certainly could answer this question as well, is um, under the PPP program that we're talking about, can you uh, somehow have your workers in a situation where they could apply for unemployment, but you as an employer can get partial or full PPP payments for payroll? I think not, but I wanted to hear your answer to that. Yeah, so the PPP program, um, the loan forgiveness is subject to um, uh, a couple of potential deductions. Let me just see if, there we go. Um, so the actual amount forgiven, um, basically you, you start off by taking the forgivable amount. So what were your forgivable expenditures? And then you take the proportion of your FTEs during a period before you got the loan and then the eight weeks during when you had the loan. Um, and so whatever that fraction is, so employees during the period, the eight weeks on the loan versus employees from the period before the loan that they use as a baseline. So say you lay off 25% of your employees, your, your initial, um, amount forgiven is just 75%. And then in addition to that, if you reduce the salary of any of your employees by more than 25%, those reductions also come off the top of that forgivable amount. Um, and in order to qualify for unemployment, you either have to lay off the employees or reduce their hours to a point where they can receive benefits after the income disregard. Um, so the problem here is that you're in danger of reducing your forgivable amounts. The more you lay off employees, the more you reduce the amount you can be forgiven. Um, so you could still get some forgiveness, um, but you may not be eligible for all of it. Um, and if once you get past a certain point, and I haven't done the math on this, um, you may lose all of the forgiveness depending on what your expenses are. And I think that's going to be highly case specific because um, your expenses can all, in addition to payroll, include mortgage interest and utilities and rent. Um, so if you owe a lot of mortgage interest or you have a high, high rate of rent um, or high utilities costs, that can offset some of the loss and forgiveness from layoffs. Um, but definitely the layoffs drive down that forgiveness rate uh, very quickly, even if they're only um, furloughing people for a couple of days a week uh, to reduce your payroll expenses. So the goal of the loan is definitely to get you to keep as many people on payroll as possible. There's no requirement, as long as you pay the employee their check, there's no requirement if it for whatever reason, if there's a COVID reason or there's a lack of work reason, there's no reason to have to do any work for the business. 
Yeah, exactly. So um, the uh, they're looking at your payroll going out. They're not looking at whether the employees are doing any work to earn that pay. Um, you know, so as far as they're concerned, you may be giving your employees COVID-19 leave at full pay and benefits. Um, and that's, that's fine because you're stabilizing the workforce there, um, which is the, the goal here is to basically provide some stability for people's incomes and for the labor force. Um, and by keeping more, more people on payroll, it's less burden on the UI system and it's less people who are unemployed when we start to come out of this. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, they don't, the, the Small Business Administration um, for purposes of loan forgiveness isn't going to look at all at what the employees actually did as long as they were kept on payroll. Okay, let's talk a little bit while we're still waiting to get our council's thought on the issue that's, that's floating out there about disincentives in terms of unemployment. Um, I know there are uh, reasons to deal with health insurance and people's willingness, wanting to work, people wanting to know they have a security of a job, uh, but other than the comparability of what the UI check is versus what the payroll check is, what are some of the other factors, pro and con, that would lead to continued employment? So, sorry, there's somebody who's not muted and there's some funny background noise going on. Are, are other people being bothered by it a little bit? Okay. No. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so um, I think we're all familiar with the um, the potential for um, your unemployment check now that there's the, the federal um, enhanced payment to basically overcome your income. Um, so if I remember right, um, the, let me just do the, the math out quickly here. Um, okay. While you're doing that, uh, Damien, right. do you have any insight as to when that $600 pay, uh, additional benefit is going to start? I don't. Um, I know it's retroactive. So, it's retroactive to March 27th. The, the simple question is when does it start? Yeah, I, I don't have information. That's something I was hoping the department could tell us. Right, well, we um, asked it. It was one of our questions. So uh, with the money, basically if you're earning um, around $57,000 or less, um, you could potentially break even or come out ahead um, with your unemployment check. Um, and the, um, so, um, yeah, at $57,000, that's about $1,113 a week, which e equals, um, your unemployment check at that rate, um, plus $600. Um, so that's roughly accurate there. It's somewhere between 57 and 58,000. So from a monetary standpoint, if you didn't have any other benefits, so no retirement benefits, no health insurance, nothing like that, at that point, you're kind of doing, from a monetary standpoint, an apples to apples comparison. Right now, because of the virus outbreak, there is not a job search, a work search requirement, although you have to be able and available to work. Um, so, then you get to the question of, does the individual have the ability to quit for good cause in order to get that? Um, and we've set it up so that, uh, you know, you can quit for good cause if you're sick with 
uh, COVID-19 or you need to quarantine or you have a family member who needs you to care for them, uh, or uh, the two that are probably the most important here, uh, you have a child who is out, doesn't have school or daycare right now because of the COVID-19 closures. Um, and there are, are quite a few Vermonters who are dealing with that. And then the other piece is the closure because of the unreasonable risk at your place of business. Uh, and one thing that we're running into, um, at least anecdotally here, uh, that I've heard about from other members is uh, folks in their districts who cannot get the personal protective equipment that OSHA says they're supposed to have for their employees because of the shortage on that equipment and the fact that it's being sent to the healthcare facilities first. So other areas where there's a lot of person-to-person -person contact, uh, for example, long-term care facilities are not able to get enough personal protective equipment for all of their employees. And their employees, a lot of them fall within this range where they're earning less than $57,000 so they'll either break even or potentially come out ahead um, uh, with the uh, insurance. So then the question for the employee really becomes balancing uh, on the one hand, their sort of time in that job and commitment to that job and any benefits they may receive through that job versus a slightly larger check potentially through um, the end of July if they stay unemployed that long. Um, and then having whenever the economy starts to recover and the, um, the stay home, stay safe order is lifted, having to do a work search at that point um, and, and take a, a job that they're um, qualified for because if they don't meet the able available and actively searching for work requirement once the work search is lifted, then uh, they'll lose their unemployment benefits. So um, certainly in, in instances where you have a low hourly wage with no benefits uh, and a potentially high risk or high stress job right now, you could see an incentive that people would have to leave their job and take the unemployment on the argument that they, um, they're they at an unreasonable risk or you know, potentially their child is home um, and needs care. Um, on the other hand, I think uh, you'll see with, um, you know, folks where either their employer has that personal protective equipment, so they don't have the potential to say there's an unreasonable risk, um, or they've got really uh, solid benefits that they don't want to lose. Um, you know, for example, if you have good health insurance, you're not going to want to give that up right now. Um, so there, there's definitely a balancing act there. Um, we are not permitted, uh, and I, I mentioned this at the very end of the call uh, last time, and I think it's worth reiterating now that everyone's on, we are not permitted to reduce the amount of our weekly unemployment benefit or the length of unemployment benefits that people are entitled to uh, without losing eligibility for the federally enhanced benefits. Uh, uh, that I, is a yeah, I sent that around to the Senate uh, so that people, because there was discussion about that and I, uh, just to clarify, because in face of this, as you know, people were thinking, well, could we lower the UI benefit so that they could, then it would equal their pay. And, you know, there was all that kind of conversation. And so to derail that, or, I mean, I, we just needed to be clear to people that we were going to lose the CARES money if we did anything to that. Right. And so I, I think there, at this point, the talk is about, um, are there ways to encourage people to stay on the job? Right. Um, That's and our so... I know there are discussions going on. I don't think there's anything that I can share about that at this point. Um, but I know that that's a topic of conversation is just, you know, how do you provide an incentive for people to stay on the job if they don't have those incentives necessarily through their workplace or their employer, you know, can't afford to pay them hazard pay or something like that. 
at this point, knowing that a lot of employers are in a very tight spot financially right now, so they can't necessarily afford to have a 30% increase in their payroll costs. Right. Um, so- Damien, that, this um, is Becca. Yeah. Do you know of any states um, that are looking at incentives for healthcare workers that are staying on the job, financial incentives at this point? Uh, I don't off the top of my head. Um, I uh, have been tied up with childcare um, for much, much of the morning. Um, Understood. I know Jen Carby sent out a, um, uh, uh, resource from um, one of the um, large sort of legal research groups, the group that publishes our statutes. Yeah. Um, and so I will take a look at that later. Um, I know NCSL has also put out resources, so I will look through that and see if I can find anything. Um, and I know that there's some work going on actively right now to try to figure out options um, and whether some of the federal dollars that are coming to the state, you know, could potentially be used um, to provide, a, you know, some sort of incentive, especially for high risk workers. Yeah. Um, you know, in, a, in essential jobs such as healthcare, long term care, grocery stores, things that we need to basically stay open um, and that are really feeling a crunch right now. Right. So I have. A question. I mean, in addition to the benefits that people get and the job protection they may have by continuing to work, I, I sort of have an, I think it's existential and practical at the same time. Where does the fact that for the concept of flattening the curve for all of Vermont, where does that fit in, in terms of whether we want people to make the choice based upon dollars and benefits, and maybe in some cases you want the choice of them not going into work for their own safety. And, you know, I think it's probably less of an issue for uh, first responders and hospital workers, but other businesses. Is there an element here where, and I think we've set up the law where if there is an unreasonable risk that they're going to get disease or spread the disease that we actually want them to take unemployment benefits. Right. And I, I think the law is set up right now so that employers are not disadvantaged. Um, if, for example, they're not able to provide a safe workplace as OSHA's kind of set out the guidelines on that, um, they're not disadvantaged by their employees' um, taking unemployment right now because they won't be charged uh, or their experience rating won't be charged for at least eight weeks of those benefits. Um, so I think the question for the Senate and uh, the General Assembly more broadly is going to be, if you do create an incentive, how do you tailor it so that it's uh, aimed at folks who are in jobs that are really crucial to public health and public well-being? versus, um, you know, more broadly. And I mean, I think we, we've all heard stories about employers where it's hard to see what their reason for staying open is, asking their employees to continue coming to work versus um, other employers, uh, you know, the healthcare industry, the long-term care grocery stores, we're hearing about the crunch that they're all feeling right now and the difficulties that their staff are facing in terms of a lack of protective equipment, um, extremely enhanced exposure to the virus, uh, and um, very difficult, challenging working conditions right now, um, where they're dealing with a very high volume, limited staff numbers, uh, and very high stress um, work situation. So I think a lot of these are gonna be policy questions that you have to consider. Um, and I'm not sure where you draw that line. So I, I want to, um, I want to uh, piggyback or go back to Becca's question. I think in this kind of situation, we really need to know what everybody's doing across the country because everybody's facing the exact same problem. 
It's not just us. We, you know, we may have a, a mid range of our maximum unemployment benefit, but whether it, the maximum is $450 or 513, the feds put $600 on top of that, that puts this added financial pressure on decision-making or complicates it anyhow. So, and I'm sure other states are facing situations with masks and other equipment that make it an unhealthy workplace, nursing homes and residential care homes and those kinds of things. So uh, I hope as soon as we see anything new from other states and we hear about it, I mean, we'll continue to go through it, but there's no sense in reinventing the wheel if people are already coming up with some creative ideas. And, you know, in my mind, right. I'm not I'm not a spendthrift, but we got to get past these three months or whatever. And if we need to put money towards the problem to fix it on the back end, we'll figure out how to repay that stuff. Right. 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 And I, I will take a look um, at what other states are doing. Um, I know some of the discussions are, are happening offline right now um, yes. about kind of addressing some of the this. Um, so, um, but I, I will start researching that and follow up with the committee once I have a listing of other things and I'll just plan to keep updating that list uh, as additional sort of measures become, um, become public or are starting to get discussed. Um, but I, I will reach out to um, NCSL and uh, to also just start going through the resources we've got on that issue. Um, right. And then as soon as I've got a, a decent list, I will send it to the committee. So uh, I'm, I'm concerned. Um, I think there's needless to say some sense of urgency on this because people will be, once they start knowing and understanding this, then there may be movement like immediately. Uh, and so I, I think like, like the evictions, there's a sense of urgency about this for us to figure out fairly soon. Right, and I so mean, just, to, just to, to, to be clear, um, I've, I've been working with some of your Senate colleagues on this issue yeah, since yesterday. I, I and with, with the folks at JFO, we have another meeting this afternoon. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, this is a priority right now. Yeah, it, it, thank you so, so much. I, I realize you're doing that, so thank you. Yeah, and I, I think this is something that a lot of people are aware of right now, particularly if you have a, uh, you know, a healthcare facility or a um, long-term care facility nearby. And I think everybody in the Senate has, uh, has those in their district. So you're aware Absolutely. of the challenges they're facing. Some of us even have parents in those facilities. Yes. So I don't know, uh, Cheryl, do you have anything you might want to say? I understand that you're on the committee that's for the task force that's looking at this. Well, just that, um, as Damien has said, JFO is working on this and is going to come up with some um, scenarios that we would look at. So I think that we need to wait until um, the numbers are in there and uh, then we can discuss it further. Um, the other thing I, I've been thinking about, I mean, we've been talking a lot about small businesses, but here in Rutland, GE has just, you know, laid off 50% yeah. of their, their workforce. So what is there, maybe Damien can address this for large businesses, you know, in the CARES Act. I mean, what can we look forward to there as far as some kind of um, help so that not all of the benefits are going to be falling on you know UI in the state. So um, we've talked about the the various small business loans that are out there. Uh, there was also a significant portion of um, money in the CARES Act uh, that was dedicated to sort of more industry specific spending. Mm -hmm. um, I <coughs> don't know the details of that. Uh, it's not something I've looked at closely. Um, this was, uh, it, towards the end of the bill, it's where the, 
I think most of us have read about the airline money, mm -hmm. uh, the loans for the airline industry. This also included funding for um, national defense and other other industries that Congress deemed kind of crucial to the the you know national well-being um, to try to keep them up and running. But I don't know the details of that. Um, and I know, uh, you know, with with uh, folks like the GE plant, I mean, the struggle they're facing is that um, they may have some money coming in, but it's not business as usual. Um, and so they have to let a portion of their staff go. What we have um, provided in the UI is some cushioning against their UI experience rating um, to the extent that they have to lay off staff related to um, the uh, COVID-19, you know, emergency order, stay home, stay safe, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the governor's order has exceptions for um, sort of essential businesses, which I think include national security. Um, but to the extent that they have business that's not covered by that order, um, and they're laying off people, they would have some protection there. Um, beyond that though, uh, there, there's not a lot that I can offer you as far as insight goes. I just yeah. haven't and, had and, a chance to dig that deeply. And it my, might be something, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say, my question is, you know, what is there in the CARES Act that would kind of relieve some of the pressures from the state? far as UI goes, where people would be getting benefits, but not necessarily under the unemployment insurance from the state? So I, I think the, um, the, the big things in the CARES Act, as far as Vermont is concerned, um, the biggest impact will be through the small business loans um, to mm -hmm. keep people on because most of our businesses uh, virtually all of the businesses in the state fall under the qualify for the small business loans. Uh, unfortunately, our, our largest employers like GE and um, other groups like that don't fall under the small business piece, but um, I'd have to look at the employment numbers, but it's, it's more than 96% of our businesses qualify as a small business. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that's the biggest thing to cushion the impact on the, the UI trust fund. Um, the other piece is that for sole proprietors um, and self-employed individuals, the disaster unemployment ins assistance, whenever it uh, becomes available, will be there to help as well. It doesn't keep them from laying off any employees they have, but it does, uh, help them get a bridge and it keeps money flowing into the economy to the extent that you can actually um, spend it right now locally or something like that. But, um, you know, that, uh, I mean, there, unfortunately, there's not a lot that we can do outside of the, um, the sort of federal small business loans, except to the extent the state stands up some sort of grant program, um, which I, I don't know if there's money available to do, um, to kind of encourage small business owners uh, or businesses around the state to keep employees on payroll rather than on, on UI. Uh, Cheryl, your question, which you'd included, I was sort of hoping that Lindsey Curling would get to, uh, because it wasn't, you know, the larger employers and what, what ACCD is thinking, what are their thoughts about that? So we can re get back to that with them at some point, because they may have some thoughts about that, that we didn't have time to talk about today. And then, Go ahead, Allison. So um, we still have no Michael Harrington or Cameron Wood, I take it. Uh, excuse me, this is Faith uh, speaking. We've just had one of our live videos hacked, so I had to lock down the meeting, which is to not allow participants in. I'm working with Denise to notify the three people that you're expecting. We haven't heard from them yet. 
but I will have to We've unlock. We've heard from Dirk. We have heard from Dirk Anderson, and he did and try to get in. He has tried to get in? Right, and I just sent him an email, which I'm sure I had a chance to read yet, that uh, says, you know, you can call in. No, um, they I can't can see... call in, Denise. The oh, immediate oh, oh, I thought they could. No. Well, I thought. So, um, Senator Sorotkin, would you like us to arrange these next people to join the call, or do you want to pick it up tomorrow? I think, I think uh, it's five minutes before journey. Right. We have another call coming up, or I, I do anyhow, with Representative Mark Cott. So I think maybe we'll um, close Til tomorrow. Down. But I do want to hear from Allison as to uh, her uh, impression of where we are on landlord tenant. I want to thank her for the excellent job she did on Tuesday. Um, and um, uh, I know that. Uh, some folks are hoping that uh, we might be able to combine a bill here on landlord tenant in our Senate, uh, Senate meeting on Tuesday, where we're going to be dealing. I understand it could be changed on Tuesday. We're going to deal with the rule change on remote voting. Um, obviously, every day we lose on the eviction issue, if we're going to do anything, is is not helpful to flattening the curve. So um, I'd like to hear from Allison. I think we have it on our schedule to talk about again tomorrow at 930, but let her bring us up to speed. Well, um, it occurred to me, I, Tom and I had a, a catch up after our meeting on Tuesday. Um, and then we talked again Wednesday morning. Uh, it occurred to me that the Senate is poised to act sooner than the House. But, and Becca, correct me if I'm wrong, but the House has yet to even be looking at a draft rule about the body voting remotely, I think. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So, so Tom and I, Tom was thinking if they could get the bill into good shape, which they did yesterday, and I have yet to be able to connect with him today because we just haven't had the, the time. But um, I thought maybe uh, Michael, Tom, and I could meet because we, if we, if we could create a Senate vehicle and vote it out tomorrow morning, we could have a bill on the floor ready to go next week, our landlord tenant, our evictions bill. So we're poised to take action faster than they are. It struck me we could do that uh, and, and, and speed this whole eviction uh, uh, opportunity, you know, the, the eviction bill along faster if we did it that way. So that is the uh, question. I, I I believe they did. Uh, Damien can. Oh, no, it was David Hall. Um, anyway, I, we need to have that conversation with Tom. But I think we're in pretty good shape for tomorrow morning. Uh, and the question is, would we be able to vote on it tomorrow morning and choosing the vehicle that we could do a strike call on and, and put it on? Well, it seems to me, though, we had a question uh, the last time that we met, uh, and we sent back Vermont Legal Aid and the landlords to see if they Correct. could recognize a petition. A, 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 yeah, and, and they did. They were supposed I, to do that work for the, the Wednesday meeting for the House, and that's what I haven't been able to find out if that actually happened. Yeah, because that, that would be key in terms of to vote this out. Uh, if we don't have an appropriation, I think there will be more just Yes, it, it's it. My hope is that so anyway, uh, I'll email you all once I find out from Tom. And while Michael's talking to Mark Cott, I'm going to call Tom because that'll be the first moment I've had. And, I, and, and we're sort of like uh, this is more for Becca. We're sort of in this a weird uh, time frame here because I know what I've read and being able to catch up that Tim and the rules committee wants uh, us to get permission to be working on something and get permission to vote on a, a not bill. Not permission to work on, Michael. Not permission not to vote. vote. We're just talking about voting in terms of getting something on the calendar. Not permission to work on something well, I, at this point. Okay. Okay. So even permission to vote, this is still sort of in a strange area because I don't think that's been formally adopted. But in any event, I'm going to talk to Tim about it. If we're going to do something, this is the kind of thing that 
the whole purpose of remote voting is to move things along. And, you know, if we have to wait on a vote for this till after the, uh, the rules committee or the rules changes, it's going to delay things. So I'll talk, talk to him. And, you know, my own personal position on this has always been that we should have a, a moratorium, but we should have a provision for exceptions for emergency. And I think that's where the bill is going. Uh, and it shouldn't just apply to filing of eviction proceedings. It should also file to writs of possession that are waiting to be served. So if there's a if there's a reason to go forward with that writ, uh, writ of possession that an individual judge finds is worthy, I'm comfortable with the default position being that they're stay that that all the ones that are pending are stay are stayed right. unless there's an emergency that a judge feels is necessary, like the classic example of a meth lab, which I don't know if that's a real <laughs> or not, but uh, uh, that would certainly be something that yep. we might want to close down. So um, okay, so we will reconvene at nine thirty tomorrow morning. To keep posted your email from some of the follow-up calls we're having and uh, uh, Randy and Allison, I will uh, reschedule the task force so it doesn't interfere with the rules committee meeting tomorrow.